You'll see my PowerPoint. That means yes. Yes. Arteries, blood, blood vessels, whatever. It's on vessels, blood vessels. That's what this whole chapter's on. I can't see um, your screen. Can't see my screen? What do you see right Wait, now? Wait, I can. I can. Right. Okay. Uh, this thing doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? I mean, as it is. I, mean, I guess yes, we can go back to it. Um, so I kind of see it like this. Um, so arteries are like, like major interstates. You know, there's, there's, there's a few of them in your body. They're not as numerous, but, um, things can go quickly. Traffic can move fast down it and there's lots of lanes. So that's kind of an artery. And then you have smaller roads. So that would be like Claiborne, Judge Perez, Paris Road. You know, there's more than one lane of traffic and you're going faster than on a residential street. So I think of that as an arterial. These are all like the red blood cells. Or I guess in this analogy, we they're, they're like the cars, right? And then, then you get to capillaries and capillaries are like, residential streets there's a ton of capillaries compared to arterials and arteries right but some of those capillaries are really small and you only get one red blood cell at a time through them just like some streets are so small and when you get people parking on the street you can only get one car down the street at a time um, so that's kind of like a capillary and then i put here like in blue these are representing houses or actually cells in this analogy, right? These are the cells. And then you have all this white space in between the blue houses. That's the interstitial fluid. So, and then I guess the, the people inside these cars, that would be like oxygen and carbon dioxide, right? So the oxygen gets out of the car walks across the lawn and goes into the house. And um, so that's what red blood cells do. They carry oxygen, right? So the oxygen gets out, crosses the interstitial fluid, goes into the, into the uh, house. Anyway, and then carbon dioxide is going the other way. Okay, but this is all going from the heart out to the cells but you've got um you've got carbon dioxide what do we do with those right what do we do with all the carbon dioxide well that's moving into the car as well so as like the oxygen's getting out the carbon dioxide's going in so they're like switching places and then we're going to take those down a different type of street called a venule and then those become veins right and so that's headed back to your heart Remember, it's really confusing because when you talk about a pulmonary artery and a pulmonary vein, that's actually reversed. But this is like most of the time we're talking about. This is called, this is all systemic circulation. So it's like, look like here's the, the oxygenated blood. It leaves the aorta. That's a big artery. It's going into different arteries. And then the arteries become smaller and smaller and they go into these capillary beds and then on the way back these are like venules veins and then we go back to the heart again so like out from the heart it's going to all the places in the body back from the heart back to the heart um and then you see like i put some purple circles here because I'm trying to say that there's not like a um, there's not like a definite line between oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood it's when you're at that capillary level there's you know it's partly oxygenated partly deoxygenated but that's kind of like my analogy right so we're going to talk about some we're going to talk about all five of these blood vessels, artery, 
arterial capillary venial vein. So we got five different types of blood vessels. To be honest, I don't have much to say about arterials. I mean, um, sorry. I gotta, let me get rid of my, quit. Oh, and I gotta let somebody in too. Welcome. All right, back to the PowerPoint. Okay. Yeah, this is to show you the arteries and the veins. I guess that's a better, kind of a better photo. So it all leaves the heart as the aorta. All the oxygenated blood leaves the aorta. And you see how like it arches here and then it's gonna drop down behind the heart and then there it is. And then if you're in lab, you remember those three things coming out of the top? So there's like, you know, like this is a subclavian. Well, this is, this is the, the um, this is subclavian around the shoulder, subclavian around the shoulder, carotid going up the neck, and then here's the other carotid. So this one right here actually is going to branch out into a carotid and a subclavian. So a lot of these arteries, <clears throat> and this is something more we're doing in lab, but they're named a lot of them, and not all of them, are named after like bones or like an area of the body. I would say one of the exceptions is that this one is like a brachial. But like cubital, for example, that's in like your arm area. Axial is like in the armpit area. Um, then they're kind of named after bones. This would be like a radial artery. And this would be like an ulnar artery. This is femoral, popliteal. So it's the names after like, you know, if you remember any of the bones or areas of the body, you know, tibial, fibular, fibial, whatever. Most of the big ones are named after the bones, right? So those are all the arteries. Um, of course, there's tons of small ones. And if you ever have to take a guess, just kind of see what organ it might be going to. And, you know, if it's going to the liver, you'd call it like hepatic. If it's going to the um, kidneys, you'd, you'd call it renal. You're not always going to be right, but that's kind of a, you know, if in doubt, name it after the bone or name it after where it's going. Let me let this person in. And there, oh, there's the veins going back, right? So that's all the systemic venous return. They all, all these veins, and a lot of them have the same names. I would, I would just say that one, maybe one significant one that that um, is not named after a bone is this long one down the legs. So great saphenous, and and you'll learn that in lab. But this is the great saphenous vein. But anyway, um, all these veins are going back to the superior, whatever this vein's called, superior something, and this inferior something that's underneath the heart, this thing, vena cava. All right, so out through the aorta, back in through the vena cava. And where does the vena cava empty into? What part of the heart does the vena cava empty to? Just think about it for a second. If you don't remember, ask yourself, what type of blood is it? Is this oxygenated or deoxygenated? And that's going to give you the side of the heart. And then, um, of course, it's going to be the atria. The atria receive blood. So then you just ask yourself, which side of the heart? And then what, what chamber of the heart is right before the aorta? So again, you ask yourself, oxygenated, is it deoxygenated? 
Is the heart receiving it or shipping it out? Right, and that'll give you the answer. All right, let's look at the arteries. This is this is an well. This is a vein on the right. This is an artery on the left. Let's look at the artery. So the artery actually is multi-layered. There's lots of layers to it. Um, there's muscle in it. There's elastic in it. There's some other connective tissue. And of course, there's epithelial cells because the lining of everything is epithelial tissue. So that's just an easy. If I never showed you this and I said, tell me some layer of tissue in the, um, hold on. You know, tell me some layer of tissue in your, um, Blood vessels, you would say epithelial. Well, you know it's aligned with epithelial. So there's like three coats. That's what a tunic is. All right, so tunica, they're called tunica interna or tunica intima. Tunica interna, tunica media, tunica externa. Inner coat, middle coat outer coat. So the tunica interna has three layers right here. This, this epithelial tissue, which we're calling it endothelium, because when epithelial tissue is in your blood vessels, we call them endothelium. And if you remember, a lot of epithelial tissue is attached to a basement membrane. So it's epithelial tissue attached to a basement membrane. And then there's a layer of elastic underneath that. And that's that's what it is. That's the tunica interna. Epithelial tissue, endothelial tissue, attached to a basement membrane with a layer of elastic underneath. That's that's that inner layer, that inner coat. The next layer, the tunica media, it's a layer of muscle and it's a layer of elastic. It. So, you know, most of our blood vessels have a layer of muscle. Um, capillaries don't have muscle. Um, veins have muscle, but they don't really use it. I mean, I don't even know why it's there. It's very thin and not used. But um, arteries and arterioles absolutely, absolutely have, um, have muscle. Right, and we use that, we're going to use that to control blood pressure. So let's look at the outer layer. So the first layer has, th the, the tunica interna has three things. The tunica media has two things. And the tunica externa is just one thing, which is just connective tissue. But I don't have anything special to say about it. Let's go back to this tunica media. So look at this. There, see, you see the muscle here, and then you see this, this gray Swiss cheese looking thing. That's the elastic. This is the muscle. It's different depending on where this artery is. So if you look at if you look at an artery, like let's say, let's look at these arteries, the carotid artery, the subclavian. You don't need to have a thick layer of muscle. The reason we have muscle there is because we want to have vasoconstriction. You want to constrict the vessel. You can't do that here. Look how close to the heart it, it is. Right? You're going to you're going to mess the heart up. You're constricting blood vessels and then you're going to stop things from leaving the ventricle. So that's not what the muscle's for. But look down here, right? Down in your arms, down in your legs. Yeah, if you get cut and you're bleeding, you want to be able to constrict that, those, those arteries and slow down blood loss. Or more importantly, if your blood pressure is really low, you want to be able to constrict your blood vessels in your arms and legs and keep all the blood in your abdomen and thorax, keep it all in the core. All right, so those, 
you know, uh, arteries that are further away from the heart would tend to look like this. They would have a thick muscle layer and a thin elastic layer. So we would call those muscular arteries. Right. But let's go back to the ones that are close to the heart. So if the ones close to the heart don't have a thick muscle layer, then they're going to have a thick elastic layer. So if I take, like if this muscle was super thin, you know, just like a little thin slice, and this elastic was really thick, then that would tell me that this artery goes up here maybe. Because you don't want to constrict your blood vessels close to the heart. On the contrary, you want them to be able to stretch out and then like, you know, elastic, like be elastic. It like, like so when the blood surges into that artery, it's going to like stretch out and then it's going to snap back and that pushes the blood even further. So those are elastic arteries. You know, as you get closer to the heart, they tend to be elast elastic arteries. And as they are further away from the heart, they tend to be muscular arteries. And that all has to do with the tunica media. You know, is the, is the elastic thicker or is the muscle thicker? The other name for them are conducting arteries and distributing arteries. Because the elastic, like they conduct, they help, they help to push the blood through your uh, body. Muscular distributing, because you can shut blood flow, not like shut it off, but you can decrease it. Well, you can almost shut it off, to be honest. You could decrease the blood to your arms and legs if you're in shock or if your blood pressure is low for some reason. You could try to keep it in the middle. So these are two types of arteries. All depends on that tunica media. Let's take a quick look at the, this is just a slide. Um, what, what do we want to see? Let's look at this one down here. You see, these are like, um, I wonder if I can make it bigger. Nope. That's a red blood cell, red blood cell, red blood cell. You can see all the red blood cells, right? So this capillary is so small that all it's accommodating is like a red blood cell. You see these, dot, these dots, these darker dots? All that is is the nucleus of an epithelial cell, right? So it's like if you look at a capillary, all it really is, it's endothelial tissue and a basement membrane. So it's not very complicated. It's like the first two layers of this artery, and that's all it is. There's not really any elastic. There's not really any muscle. So, you know, these are epithelial cells here. And that's what you're looking at here. You're looking at the, epi the, the nuclei of the epithelial cells, and then you're seeing the blood, you know, one layer of red blood cells moving through there. This, on the other hand, is an artery. You can see some of the layers of it. You know, this is, you can't see it, but this is all like all right here with my cursor. These are all red blood cells in here, right? This is the, this is like elastic. See how it's like dark here that, and see how it's dark out here too. That's elastic. That's the other layer of elastic. So like, if you look right here, here's a layer of elastic. Here's another layer of elastic. If I look at the actual slide, layer of elastic, layer of elastic. That elastic looks thin to me compared to the muscle, right? So my guess is that this is a, this artery is probably from like one of the limbs. I know these things are like kind of hard to make out sometimes. Um, yeah. Okay. So you need to know that. So why when you look at the front of the heart, the anterior, it's less of like description, but when you look from the posterior, you see more of the actual uh, 
arteries and veins and all that. Like on the slides that I had last time, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's just the publisher. I mean, I don't I think there's more to see on the front of the heart than the back. So I don't know. Well, mostly every every image is like that because I even have a book that's based on a heart and it does the same. Like it puts all the the like it points to everything on the back and not so much the the front. Um, we need to know this slide or the slide you just explained. Not that. No, I mean, no, because you're gonna know that you're going to know this one for lab. So this no. This one right here. So just just this one. The two types of arteries. Yeah. I bet. It's very informative. You're doing a great job. <laughs> Look at you feeding my ego. All right. I'll let you know if you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, check that out. Okay. Um, before I go into this, let me go back to this. We talked kind of about arteries. What's an arterial? It's... It's just like a smaller artery. I mean, its function is to slow down traffic, right? It's to slow things down. There's, I mean, look how many blood cells can fit across this artery, like whatever lots, right? Um, this one's a little smaller, and then this one can only fit one. So you don't want to go from like I-10 straight onto a residential street, right? You're going like 80 and then you're going to go on a residential street. You got to like slow things down, right? So you put people on, on a uh, rampart or something and you like slow traffic down a little bit. There's not four lanes anymore. There's like one or two going in each direction. And you know, you're not going 80. You have to go like, I guess you're supposed to go 35 or 40, right? So you're slowing things down. And so once you turn on that residential street, you're ready to go. You're supposed to go 25. So you're ready to go 25. Right. So that's what arterials do. They slow things down. You do not want a bunch of red blood cells cramming into a capillary at the same time and going fast that you're going to burst because those capillaries, remember, if you look at them compared to, <clears throat> here's the um, artery, here's the capillary, right? The, the capillary is not set up to hold that kind of traffic. I mean, if this is an interstate with like lanes and cement and everything, this capillary is like a, it's not even a dirt road. It's just like a track through grass that a car made, right? It's just not set up for heavy traffic. So... The, the arterial slows things down. It, it slows the pressure down. I mean, that's really what it's about. The arteries have lots of pressure compared to the capillaries. So you want to slow that pressure down before you get to the capillaries. If you ever see like, like pinpoint hemorrhages in your eye or certain bruising, that's just capillaries getting busted. You know, they get, they get damaged super easy. So that's what arterials do. They do have an ability to constrict and um, probably wondering if I was looking at my phone. You'll never know. So I had it under the desk. Arterials are able to constrict as well. Arteries and arterials. For example, when you learned about angiotensin II, I don't know if you remember what that does, but I hope you do. It's one of the things that it does that it's a vasoconstrictor. So it goes to those arterioles and it constricts them, which makes the blood pressure go up. So anyway, here's your arterial. Here's the capillaries, right? So capillaries are kind of like in a bed. They call it a capillary bed. So I, 
for me, I just think about like a dense residential neighborhood. You know, it's just like a bunch of streets that are right there. You know, you have a house and then the house behind it is on like another residential street. Right. So it's like that's how I kind of view the capillaries. Right. Um, your body is able to shut the capillary beds down. So they have like these little sphincters. The sphincter is just like a ring of muscle. Like your anal sphincter. Um, it's like that. You have those throughout your body. Um, mostly they're in your GI tract, your digestive system, and they're used to like keep food going in the same direction. Here, these uh, precapillary sphincters are used to potentially shut blood flow off to the tissues. So if my blood pressure plummeted, I need that blood at my heart because the heart's most important. And then maybe the brain after that, but the heart, I need to get all that blood here. So I don't care about giving oxygen to my hand or my arm, right? So there's all these capillary beds in my arm. They're all getting shut off. And in fact, the blood's going to get on like a, like a, you know, it's like a contra flow, you know, the, the, your body sets itself up to get everything back up your arm, right? So these things shut off. They go through these things called thoroughfare channels. Get it right back into the vein quick. Get it back to the heart. Get it back to like the middle part of your body. So um, that's just one thing. You're, that's just like one of the things your body can do. But anyway, they, they are capillary beds, right? And so if you look at these capillary beds, some of it's red, some of it's purple, some of it's blue. What they're trying to tell you with this photo is that at the level of the capillary beds, it's not definitely oxygenated. It's not definitely deoxygenated. You've got oxygen moving out of the bloodstream, and you've got carbon dioxide moving into the bloodstream. They're passing each other up. But by the time it gets to a venule, yeah, it's 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 deoxygenated blood and it's it's on its way back to the heart. By the way, Liz, I want to thank you for um taking a long time with your order <laughs> cuz it allowed me to jump in front of you. I don't know, I just thought of that. Sorry, I have three guys at home. <laughs> you got me my coffee faster. You were seeming a little indecisive with your order. Yeah, I get like that. It's all, but it's, I always get the same thing. So <laughs> you, you probably never worked fast food. Yeah, I have. I used to work at Wendy's when I was a teenager. Really? Uh huh. So you know, you don't want to be one of those people. Yeah, no. <laughs> oh, what's the baconator? I don't know, man. It's got bacon. <laughs> oh, is that pretty good? I don't know. You like bacon? No, I knew what to get. I knew what I was getting, but um, I was trying to find out if they had a mocha hot coffee. If they have what? A mocha hot coffee. Yeah, like there's machines always going down, huh? I feel like they are. Like if you want like a special coffee drink, they're saying you gotta go to PJs all, and stuff. Machines <laughs> down. You know yeah. what's always down? The the shakes. Yeah, they always get me with that. And I like I like the coffee with caramel, so I was trying to make sure they had it. <laughs> caramel There's a website ice. called Nick Broken and it maps out where all the um, shake machines are down. So like real time, so you could like look and see which McDonald's location the, has the machine currently broken. Because they say one fourth at any time are are down. All right. That McDonald's stuff's not going to be on the test. This is though. I think I might have this on another slide. No, I don't. Okay, so let's look at the capillaries here. Capillaries are. Epithelial cells, endothelial cells. They're endothelial cells and a basement membrane. That's that's all they are. So very 
simple. There's no tunicas, whatever. It's, it's just that. But there's different types of capillaries because in different places in your body, stuff moves no. in and out faster. Stop. So think about, like if you were to think about your brain, you don't want a lot of anything else in your brain. Your brain's got CSF. Um, it's got like a closed system. It doesn't like stuff from the blood potentially getting to the brain. Like you get that thing infected, you're screwed, right? So you you get that's got it. You got to keep this all clean, physically speaking. Um, so you're gonna find these types of capillaries, which we call continuous, and the only space there is for things to get in and out of this capillary are through like these little spaces. Like, see, this is one cell here, and this is another cell here. You got that little space in between the cell, the intercellular cleft. That's pretty much the only space you can get things in and out. So something like the brain, you really want to keep that tight. You don't, you don't want to be liberal with how much stuff leaves the blood and how much stuff goes back into the blood. They've got their own system to handle stuff like that. But if you look down here, these intercellular clefts are a little bit larger. It's not looking like it, but just trust me, they are. And you also got these holes, these pores, called fenestrations. So these are called fenestrated capillaries. So that's going to allow things to go through, you know, a lot easier. So maybe, you know, like uh, glands that make hormones like maybe in the thyroid gland, I would expect to find these because I'm you're trying to move stuff into your blood all the time. And you're also, if you remember, you're trying to get iodine from the blood. So things are going in and out of the capillaries a lot more. So I got all these little fenestrations in here, which mean like windows, um, to allow things to go in and out. So bigger, larger intercellular cleft and... These have fenestrations, whereas you don't see that here. If you look at these ones over here, they've just got massive fenestrations, like big holes. And the, and the space between the, the cells is very large. Some of these can even handle a red blood cell. So here, you could have a red blood cell leave the capillary or go into the capillary. Where might you find this in the body? What what places in the body deal with red blood cells? Don't your liver? Yep, liver. And lungs. Think about what makes them. I said lungs. Right? The lungs don't make it. The bones. But the lip bones. What part of the bone? The bone marrow. The bone marrow. So like in your bone marrow, you've got these sinusoid capillaries, right? Because you make – your bone marrow is going to make a red blood cell. Where are you going to put it? you got to stick it into the blood. This is where do you do that? You do it in the capillary. You can't open an artery and put a blood vessel in it. As soon as you open that artery, it's like a fire hydrant. Right? So you stick it in the capillary. So you got like these big sinusoid capillaries. And same thing with the liver. The liver – is taking the old red blood cells and like phagocytizing them, you know. So in the liver, you're gonna find these big sinusoid capillaries. So different capillaries are like depends on where they are in your body. But I like you to know the three types: continuous, and then I like you to know with continuous, it's just the intercellular cleft. Fenestrated, larger intracellular cleft and fenestrations so this okay i couldn't read that okay i can read it all and then whatever you put for fenestrations fenestrated capillaries you put it for sinusoid but you say something like really huge so really huge intracellular clefts really huge fenestrations or even bigger. 
And the cloths are the little things that are in there, right? It's like where two cells join together, it's that little space between, they're not quite touching. So there's like a little space between the cells. Oh shit, I gotta take a picture of this. They won't let me like make this the big screen. I don't know why. So like I had to like look all the way. Well, you make, what are you seeing right now? Like I see it in big screen, but it won't let me like let it take up the entire screen. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, like it says full screen already. So like I can't, or maybe I can shrink this. Try pinning it or something. I don't know. Go to the three little dots at the bottom next to the end button uh -huh. and then click that and you're going to see a point where it says full screen it makes it a little bit bigger oh i put change to spotlight okay it's bigger now hello yeah you got it yeah it's good now i can see it way better now Okay. It looks like a FaceTime call now. Way better. So that's the three types of capillaries. Uh, three types of capillaries. Okay. Now I want to talk about how things get in the capillaries and get out of the capillaries. I might write on the board for this. Eh. Maybe I'll Don't do it. I'm not. Talk me out of it. Very persuasive. Um, <clears throat> so, fluid moves into the capillaries and out of the capillaries all the time. So we're talking about, to go back to like this slide, we're talking about stuff going from the white area into here. And, and stuff in here, this is like, there's a lot of fluid in here, right? That the blood cells are floating in fluid. So stuff from this fluid moves out and fluid moves in. So how does that happen? It's, it's, it's by diffusion, but since we're talking about fluid water, it's like osmosis. So there's so whenever fluid goes into a capillary well whenever fluid goes out whenever fluid moves out of a capillary into the interstitial fluid we call that filtration so right here um you've got these two words like you see right here at the bottom it says pressure is promoting filtration that word's kind of hard to read but it's saying filtration so that's fluid leaving a capillary and then reabsorption is fluid going back into the capillary so you have filtration reabsorption so that's going on all the time you have fluid leaving your capillaries all day and you have fluid going back into your capillaries so you have filtration and you have reabsorption what i would like to know is what are the pressures driving filtration or reabsorption in other words what's pushing water out of the capillaries or what's pushing water into the capillaries i mean fluid's a better word to use because it's not just water but you know what i'm saying so what's doing that um let's talk about filtration first just the fact that your heart's beating and the fact that your blood is pressurized that's a factor in filtration that's causing fluid to leave the capillaries just the fact that there's pressure from your heart like you get that your arteries are pressurized right like every time your ventricle contracts that pressures in your arteries and then that pressures in your capillaries so that pressure is also pushing some of the fluid out because your capillaries are pressurized <clears throat> But there's something else that's kind of like a push factor right that's pushing water out of your capillaries but there's something kind of drawing the water out isn't it your sodium 
That would be a really excellent guess. I was going to use that as an example. It's it's albumin. Oh, shit. But it's probably what you're thinking. It's like if you put albumin, like, let me go back to here. So if I put, wait, we can use the example with salt. Let's say, like, this is the house, this is the front lawn and driveway. If I load the front lawn and driveway with salt, water is going to come from the street and go into your front lawn and driveway because it's following the salt. Well, in this case, it's albumin, so I'll just say albumin. Right, so if I put albumin outside of the capillary into this interstitial fluid, that's going to pull the water out of the capillary. And the reverse is true. If I put albumin inside the capillary, I'm going to pull water into the capillary. So water is going to follow albumin, just like it follows. So albumin the, is what albumin, albumin is, like, is what pushes the fluid into the capillaries. Yeah, or out. It does both. Okay. So what your what your body does is that it it messes with the albumin levels. Like it it puts albumin into the capillaries or out of the capillaries depending on what it wants water to do. So when it wants to get water out of the capillaries, it pushes albumin out and then the water follows it. If you remember that's and, one of your um, that's one of your plasma proteins. It was like albumin Fibrinogen, globulins, oh, yeah. and albumin. I put transport, but this is kind of what I mean. We use albumin to move around fluid, and your body just like randomly produces it. Yeah, yeah, it's got a bunch inside. You've got a bunch of it. It's a protein. You got tons of it, but it'll use it. You know, if I want to get water, let's say I got stung by a bee, right? And so I'm, I'm delivering a bunch of white blood cells down to my hand through the, through the arteries and arterioles and capillaries, right? But now I need to get all those white blood cells out of my capillary, out of my bloodstream. I need to get it into my interstitial fluid because that's where the bee stung me. That's where like the poison is, right? So then what my body will do is it'll, it'll pump albumin out into my interstitial fluid. And then that's going to move the fluid from my blood into that area. Like that's why your hand swells. Because you're, you're increasing the amount of fluid that leaves. You're increasing filtration. Okay. So that's why people swell up sometimes. Because like with an immune reaction, it's because their body's pumping albumin out and making water leave the capillary. Oh, okay. All right. So there's two pressures. There's like a, there's a push pressure, and that's what we call that. Here they're calling it BHP, blood hydrostatic pressure. You see how they got that arrow going out? They're saying that, and don't worry about the numbers, just the fact that your blood is pressurized, that's going to push fluid out. So we call that blood hydrostatic pressure. Just means your blood pressure. Then there's like a pull factor. We call that interstitial fluid osmotic pressure. What that means is that I've got a bunch of albumin out here in the interstitial fluid, and that's kind of drawing the water out. And it also could draw it back in. When it draws it back in, we call it and that's that third one here. So it's these first three, blood colloid osmotic pressure. That means there's more albumin in the blood. And so it kind of sucks the water into the blood again. Does that have anything to do when like people have congestive heart failure and like they get swollen? It's not because of albumin, but it's this idea. Because the blood pressure, like you're, there's a backup, right? You, you, your heart's not working. And so it's like a traffic jam in your heart. And so you think about the superior, like, look, let's say your, your, your heart is a traffic jam and it's not working, right? That means that this inferior vena cava and superior vena cava, it's all backed up because now it's like got a traffic jam and you just follow it all the way down. 
traffic jam, traffic jam. It just keeps going back further and further, right? And then you get down yeah, to like your feet. Mm-hmm. You get down to like your feet, and it's got a traffic jam. And so then the fluid starts to leak out of the capillaries because it can't out of the venules because it can't start going back up to the heart now because everything's blocked up. So you could get it in your hands cool. as well, but it's more likely you see it like in your feet, like swelling in your feet. They call it like um, like a pitted edema, pedal edema. Um, it's like pitting in your feet. That's because that's from the heart. It's from the right side not working. Right? And that causes like a, when that shuts down and you're not pumping anything out of the heart, then everything starts getting backed up going into the heart. So that's why you see the fluid. That's why you see the problems with the fluid. If we were to look on the other side of the heart, then you see the backup into the lungs. So instead of like the water going into your feet, if the if the left side doesn't work, that backs up into your lungs. So you think about like the the pulmonary veins going into your lungs, that gets backed up. Then the pulmonary capillaries get backed up. Like it all gets backed up. And then that water starts to leak into your lungs. And then um, because it just gets too much pressure in your lungs and then the water leaks and then it goes into your lungs and you have problems breathing. So you can hear like sounds at the lower lobes of your lungs. The upper lobes will sound a little bit better. Right. And then you could say, well, that that might be that might be a sign of congestive heart failure, like left sided. Anyway, I know I'm getting off track probably not even your question anymore is it sorry i mean i needed to know that though so thank you i get off track but it is swelling it's swelling and it's it's the idea swelling is more filtration and not enough reabsorption causes swelling so reabsorption is blood colloid osmotic pressure so there's two factors driving filtration. This one, blood hydrostatic pressure, interstitial fluid. Oh, not that one. This one here, interstitial fluid osmotic pressure. So BHP, IFOP, those are what's causing filtration. So BHP and this one here. Ah, Yep, fluid osmotic pressure. They're causing filtration. But I want you to be able, I want you to be able to explain what they are. You know, what is blood hydrostatic pressure? Well, for that you can just say that's that's simply blood pressure, right? That's kind of self-explanatory. But what is interstitial fluid osmotic pressure? You know, and it it's where you ha- you have more albumin in the interstitial fluid. So that's attracting the water. Water follows solids. So BHP would just be blood pressure and then yeah. FOP would be too much albumin pumping out. More albumin in the interstitial fluid than the capillary. Mm-hmm. We do the same thing with sodium. Like, you know what I was saying? Like when you pee out sodium, water follows sodium. If you hold on to sodium, water's going to stay in your body. It's the same idea. Water, fo- water likes to follow these solutes like sodium or albumin. It likes to go where it goes. So if you have more albumin in the interstitial fluid, that's where the water's going to go. On this slide, they're talking about all these different things. Um, They're saying here that there are two factors driving filtration and two factors driving reabsorption. I'm I'm skipping one of those because it doesn't really, it's not really a factor. So I talked about two factors driving filtration, interstitial fluid osmotic pressure and blood hydrostatic pressure, these two. What drives absorption, reabsorption? This one in the middle, blood colloid osmotic pressure that's for reabsorption
I, mm. So they talk about, they're showing you up here, although I'm not going to ask you about this, but they're showing you a, this is part of your lymphatic system. And the reason they're showing it to you is because you've got filtration and you have reabsorption, but you don't have as much reabsorption. So you have water leaving the, the capillary, but you don't have as much coming back in. So at the end of the day, you've got like two liters of fluid that's just out in your interstitial fluid that didn't make it back into the blood. So your, your lymphatic system, these are like called lymphatic capillaries. Your lymphatic system, will, and we'll learn about that later, it takes the extra stuff. Otherwise, your whole body's going to swell. Because you got stuff, more stuff leaving than going back in. So the lymphatic system, it picks up that extra fluid and transports it away so that you don't swell. But those are the pressures driving filtration and reabsorption. Two pressures driving filtration, one pressure driving reabsorption. <clears throat> if you were to explain reabsorption, uh, BCOP, the blood colloid osmotic pressure in your own words how would it like what would i would it... say that you have more albumin in the blood than the interstitial fluid okay so the opposite of what exactly the opposite of the interstitial okay. fluid yeah more more albumin in the um blood vessels you said exactly This might be off topic, but pregnant women, when they get their swollen ankles, does that have anything to do with? I'm not sure. Because like I don't. No, that's I usually to do with the sodium level. Oh, really? Sodium? Yeah, you you build too much sodium in your your body when you're pregnant, and from being on your feet all the time, the it pretty much pushes it all the way down, and you build too much. And it, I don't know, it just, it's weird. Let me tell you something about pregnant women. This is like a medical thing I'm saying here. They're all jacked up. <laughs> you don't know what's up with them. Why do they eat strange stuff? Why do they do pica? Why, it, people try to think of these things. Oh, well, they're eating chalk because they need calcium. No, 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 it's not. Oh my God, chalk? No. They, sometimes they do that. When when I was pregnant I've with seen. my daughter, it was beef jerky. I loved beef oh, jerky. Beef jerky is good. My son, Dr. Pepper. I love Dr. Pepper. And then my last one, cheeseburgers. But it had to be like real cheeseburgers. If it wasn't real, I was not happy. <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't why want was, McDonald's. Why, why was it like that? Like, you know? It was the taste. For instance, like my mom, when she was pregnant with me, she craved sand. She would oh, have my, my dad bring her a jar of sand and she'd stick her finger in it and lick it. But, but why? it was like, nobody knows why. You know, it's just the taste. It. Like I remember going to a burger place and biting into a burger, but it was like fake patty, and all of a sudden I just got sick and started throwing my guts up everything. Yeah, but why why like I know because it tastes because of the taste, but why the taste? You know, why then in your life? Did you feel compelled? I've been hungry for just taste before. But like right after you eat and you're stuffed and then you're like, damn, a snack sounds really good right now. But she's probably not like that with cheeseburgers now. She probably eat a cheeseburger, Shit. you know, or she's not eating beef jerky today. I mean, she likes beef jerky, but not like she liked it when she was pregnant. I heard a dryer sheet. I think it's a lot to do with your hormones. Food. It's a lot to do with your hormones. I mean... You got more hormones than the average when you're pregnant. You're producing a lot more. Oh, yeah. They're and you're all over the place on top yeah. of that. When you're pregnant, usually a woman, when you're not pregnant, usually a woman has a release to release hormones. But when you're pregnant, you're just keeping it all inside. And it's really oh, not, 
as well understood as you might think it is. Like we know the hormones are going crazy and you know, hormones are at the end of the day, they're all interlinked. So when one hormone starts going crazy, other ones do, we don't know why. Like we don't know why women eat stuff that they eat, why they would eat sand. Like nobody, nobody actually understands why. We just guess, but- I'm sorry I got y'all so off track. The medical community doesn't know a lot about pregnancy. Like you think they know a lot and we have books and books and books on it. But when it really comes down to it, we're just like scratching the surface. You know, there's so much stuff that we have no idea. Like the ocean. Yeah. It's like the ocean. <laughs> Don't know. A lot of, um, a lot of anatomy and physiology is like that. You know, the more, you know, well, we have like a saying, like, those who know, know they don't know. Like, the more you know, the more you realize, man, this is just like, it's not enough information. This is just scratching the surface. There's all this stuff we don't know. How do we know that the things we do know are accurate? If there's, if, if, if we don't know 99% of it, how do we know the 1% is like, you know, why are we teaching this? But I, you got to start somewhere, right? So. But it's really too complex. Um, oh, look at that. Oh, man, I'm sorry. I hate when I do that. I wrote it all out for you. It's okay. Now I know it now. I spent all this time trying to explain it and like going like this with my hands and just doing stupid things. And I wrote it out. Of course I did because that would be the smart thing to do. Well, this is nice to have as a reference. So like when I make my study guide, it won't be as shitty as it looks right now. You know, somebody started just paying attention now and it's like, it totally worked for them. They've been like zoning out for the last 10 minutes. And now, right when I put this slide on, like, oh, that's test question. They screenshotted it, they're done. That's it, now we can read it. No, but like no, understanding it kind of helps. Like now I don't like need this to look at. Like now you can just be like, oh, what's BHP? I can just tell you blood pressure. You pretty you much know? put it into your own words. That's how I feel it should be because you're more likely to remember that. Even if you don't remember these stupid words, you'll remember the idea. And that's what's going to help you in the future. Because, you know, some of so if you go into another class, they might not call it blood colloid osmotic pressure. They might have a different name for it, but it's the same idea. <clears throat> when a doctor does a uh, order for uh, osmolarity, I think that's how you, osmolarity? I don't know if that's how you say it or not. Osmolarity. Does this have to do with that? Basically, like how your fluids are acting? Yes. It's partly yes. Like, what I mean, would they test, are, though? Like, what are they testing? Fluids that move in different ways. Like, fluids move in your brain one way, and and uh, then there's, like, the movement of fluid around your body in general, and then, like, this is more specific. We're talking about capillaries here. Okay. So it's all different. Yeah, but but it's the same thing. Like, when they're looking for osmolarity, they're looking at, like, ions. Like, they're going to look at sodium, and um, they, albumin is something that people look at. Oh, I know. Plenty of times. They love looking at that shit. So that's all written down. Yeah, look, this is, um, so you see, this is trying to show you how much the pressure drops between an artery and a vein. So we measure pressure in millimeters of mercury that's the mmhg they still use it so whenever you're getting your blood pressure it's reading like 120 over 80 or whatever it is that's millimeters of mercury that's how we measure pressure <clears throat> so that's what this is kind of showing so this is kind of like your the one in red is like your blood pressure right so what's the pressure on your arteries when the heart is relaxing when the ventricles relaxing What's the pressure on your artery when your ventricles contracting? That's the difference between systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So they're putting that cuff around your brachial artery and it, it, it's seeing that the pressure on the wall of the artery 
when your heart contracts and when it relaxes. So that's what this red thing is kind of representing. And you don't have to do it on your brachial artery. You can do a blood pressure from here. You could do it on the leg. I guess you could do it on the neck, technically. Um, but but the other the other thing on here that that I wanted to show you was this blue line. Like, look how fast it it the pressure drops it's from an artery to an arterial. Look how quick it goes down. So once that blood gets in an arterial, the pressure goes from like it's really like maybe a hundred is a better number. It goes really from like a hundred. By the time it gets down to a capillary, it's down to like 35. So it takes a big dive between the artery and the capillary. And then by the time you get to a vein, it's, I don't know, 10, not even 10, five. So there's a big difference when the blood's coming, like the blood in my artery in my shoulder is like at a hundred and the blood in the vein going back up through my shoulder it's like five. It's a big difference in pressure. That, that's why we put tourniquets on our, on uh, veins or drawing blood, right? Uh, that's why I put what? Tourniquet? That's why we put tourniquets on. Yeah, yeah. When we're oh, with, an arterial, blood, with an arterial bleed. A, a, a venous bleed, I mean, yeah, you can do it. But often with a venous bleed, you could just keep putting pressure and wrap it and because it's kind of oozing out. No, I mean like when we're drawing blood. Oh. Oh. Yeah, you're drawing like it. It doesn't from, stop it, but it like you're drawing it from the, the vein, right? I think you're doing that to to build up a little bit pr of pressure in that vein so you can see them. But I don't know. That's my guess. Like, I know when we draw lactic acids, they say not to put a tourniquet on because of, you know, it's not recommended, but, like, you could. I don't know, but, like, some patients, you like, you can stick them without the tourniquet on. Wait, what? You you guys call them tourniquets? Like, yeah. the rubber... Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry. I thought you meant, like, a tourniquet to stop blood flow. No, I mean, no. I guess, like, it could stop blood flow if you tightened it enough, but, like, I don't know. We put it on to, like... Give us blood pressure, like yeah, in the vein, so we can get blood flow faster rather than I do it. I do it so I can see the vein. Like in a lot of people, I can't, I can't get at it. So then I put the tourniquet on, and like it starts to appear. But I mean, you do that more than me. But I think it's because I think it's because like if you're stopping the vein, then it starts to like it can't get through, and it like. This is me guessing. Like, it makes the veins pop out a little bit more. I don't know. I feel like it's like a water hose. Like, you know how you, like, yeah, yeah. put your like finger that. over it and it, like, yeah. sprays more and, like, harder? Oh, really? Oh, yeah, you might be and right. it swells up. So, I didn't like, think of that. But when you watch it go into I the just tube, about doing that. you see how it goes into that tube, right? It just kind of... Yeah, but, like, if I take off the tourniquet with in the middle of, like, the blood draw... It like slows the blood flow from flying into the vacuum, you know, the vacuum tube, and it just slows it down. It it still goes, but it's just less. Like we don't want to put the tourniquet on; it'll like shoot out like, like a water gun almost. Not gonna ask if I take Katie. the tourniquet off, huh? I gotta ask Katie. I gotta ask the phlebotomy teacher why why she does it. Oh, I don't do it that goodness. often. I just it for me like when I when I put that on there it makes it it makes it easier to see. But I don't know it has something to do with hemolysis too. Like the tighter you have a, a tourniquet on, the more of a chance you have your blood from getting hemolyzed. Like it all adds up to what you were saying how it like means the red blood cells are bursting. I guess like the pressure is too much. I don't ever draw blood from people. I just, like, I'll start an IV, but I don't draw blood. So I've never, I've never drawn blood. Thank God. Why wouldn't you? I That's mean, all. like, if you're starting an IV, you might as well use, like, you were an EMT, right? Or a paramedic? Yeah, EMT. This is online. 
that it temporarily blocks the blood from exiting while still allowing enough blood to continue flow into your arm to build up in the veins behind. Yeah. The vein becomes temporary, temporarily dilated and easier to access. That's what I was thinking, yeah. That's what I thought it was for. Well, I thought it'll still flow even if you even if you remove that right in the middle of it, it'll still flow. Maybe not as like you were saying, not as fast, but it'll still come out. I'm a little excited here. I got a question. I'm so tired. I know me too. All right. Um, what time is it, by the way? It's only 10. Only time minutes. to go. We've only been here for an hour and 15 minutes. It's almost time to go, right? Actually, I don't have that. Mi well, no, I do have a lot of slides, don't I? I don't have a whole lot of stuff to talk about. You want to take a break? I mean, it doesn't make no sense. Whatever. Well, we don't have to. It's not really going to influence anything. Pressure's low in veins. Pressure's high in arteries. If you ever stuck a needle in an artery, you would know it. It wouldn't. Oh, that shit. Fuck. Oh, that shit flies out. Yeah. So that's what I thought you meant by tourniquets. Like, we use tourniquets in the field now. We used to not use it. Like, they would say, don't use it only as a last resort because that, that, uh, it's going to cause damage to the tissue in the, in the appendage. But now they've reversed it over the last few years and like, no, use it, use it, use it. And they give us a bunch of them. And they're yeah, like, for oh, a short about. time, it shouldn't be that bad. Yeah, that's what they're saying. They're like, well, you can even do it for hours. We used to think like, no, oh, no, no, 15 minutes, 15 minutes, you're causing damage. You got to like loosen that thing and let some blood flow. Now they're like, no, put it on, keep it on. If that arm just falls asleep, don't worry about it. Just keep it on. Like it could stay for a couple hours. Don't worry about yeah, it. Yeah, like the most you'll do is burst a, a few capillaries, but like that's it. Like the 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 uh, the tissue can live longer than we thought. So now that now they push it, like use tourniquets a lot. It Especially used to be just the military. Attached. What's that? I said, especially if the tissue is still attached to the body. I mean, it's gonna live because you still got all those nerves and everything flowing through it. I don't think it should be an issue. Like now they give you all those like tourni uh, those tourniquets that like those industrial size tourniquets, those big old things that you like you can put around the femoral artery whenever it gets shot, and like yeah. the arms. Yeah, yeah, that's what we have. So, we I wonder what happens if someone's neck gets cut off. When like, I see like through. arteries in the arm, I don't. I I use. I don't even know if I've ever done a tourniquet. What I would do is I would just like wrap the shit out of it. Like I would. I would. Uh, I'd put something there to like block the, like to pack the artery. And then I would just wrap it super hard to where they're like screaming in pain from the pressure that I'm putting on it. And then that's, that seems to work. Um, I just wrap it really hard, but now they want to use tourniquets. So, I mean, I get it. That's probably better. Does the doctor suture the arteries up when they get shot or what? Or I guess yeah. cut or whatever. I think they've got like they've got suture and then I heard they've got like these enzyme strips that they can like put over it and it like Oh yes, it. they do have those. They that, I think that's what they first put and then they suture on top of that. Well that's why infection rates are so shitty in the hospital right now, I think. Yeah, hospitals like everyone are really good places they get to shot. Get, hospitals are good places to get sick. Yeah. All right. We talked about this. I just wrote it down. Don't worry about MAP, although that's kind of important, but uh, it's just another type of way to read. Instead of doing systolic over diastolic, you could take a mean arterial pressure. <clears throat> um, I don't know. I think they do it in hospitals. I heard that they do. Oh, yeah. When I do in vitals, I do it. Yeah. And that's the formula for it. So you take systolic and then you add twice the diastolic to that and then you divide the whole thing by three. Or the machine you probably put it in your phone. 
<laughs> That's the easy. machine does it all. You don't even have the to do that. The machine does it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you've got like a blood pressure cuff on anyway, so it's already doing everything. So you're never gonna you're never gonna do it. They just came out with these new machines too. They're really pretty and nice and new. You just click one button and it's all there for you. You just write it down. I love all that stuff. Yeah, but it's good to know if you're outside of a hospital and you have something happen with somebody, you would need to no, know how to do it. <laughs> Yeah, right. like, like if you need it. if you need to test their blood pressure they're too far gone get rid of them if you're like on a motor vehicle accident like a major accident and then instead of having like one person in your ambulance you've got like four people like you've got them on the benches and it's all chaos right you've only got one blood pressure machine that's like battery operated and you've got like three people that you need to get blood pressure on like right now i'm shit out of luck i am shit out of luck then you gotta take Someone's out dying. your kid you gotta take out your <laughs> old kid from your bag you don't even know where that kid is because like you never go into that bag and you gotta go find it and then the sirens are going and you're hitting like every pothole in new orleans because it's like the worst place to be on an ambulance and then you're trying to listen for that bump 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 that something that you learned like 10 years ago hold on has this happened has that has this have happened to you yeah yeah this happens this happens often well not often but it happens like so like you rely on that battery powered blood pressure cuff right but there's cases now and then you need to use you need to go old school because you don't have the equipment and then i don't know man i don't know how people do it I mean, some teachers actually make the students, well, I know a few teachers I've had in the past, they want you to know the old school way compared to the new school way, just in case something would happen, you know what you're doing. Yeah, like in that case, something just happened. But you know what it really comes down to in that case is that you got to buy that expensive ass stethoscope that's like 300 bucks, and you can hear like everything with it. But when you buy the cheap ones from CVS, like most of us do, or you get the low end Litman or whatever off of Amazon, like for 50 or No, Litman is a good brand. Do they make different versions? They, they make some that are like awesome that you can hear like everything with it. And then they make some that are good, but not if you're like in a stressful situation, you can't, they're useless. Yeah, there's different stethoscope qualities. They've got different models. And I don't, I don't want to spend 300 bucks if I'm never going to use it. I mean, it ends, it stays, I never use it. It stays in my bag. I would. I like the machines. <laughs> Just let the machine do blood pressure. And then it automatically is set for like, you can set it for five minutes or whatever. And they just automatically does it again. So you get an angry patient that punches the screen off of it. Yeah, we get to tie those people down. I don't want to touch people. Gee. You got to touch those people every five minutes. That's the worst part. Uh -huh. That's what I don't get about your job. You have to touch people. I don't want to touch people. <clears throat> I love it because then, like, they can't tell you that it's abuse if you're like being really rough. It's like I'm just doing my job. You ever taken someone's blood from their fingers? Yes, their finger. My favorite knuckle sometimes for the really old people that like have no veins at all. There'd be like the IV team failed, the um, pre surgery op team failed. I would go right in the thumb, right above here. There's usually two little veins right here with a 25 gauge and right in. And I'd get the blood. Look, you don't understand. I'll go, I'm the one they call when they can't get the blood work. And I demolish. I'm the best. One stick every patient I've ever had for the past like. Eight months, one stick only. That's it. No, that's not. Yesterday they called me in for sticking a guy. They called a guy. They stuck a guy eight times in post-op surgery, right? I go in there. It literally took me 30 seconds. I found a vein, like, in his bicep, like, up here. Because he was, like, an IV drug user or whatever. I stuck him, and the nurses were freaking out. They were like, how the fuck did you do that? I'm like, don't worry about it. I have to go. I was busy. <laughs> I'm going to be a doctor. Watch. Shit on everybody. <laughs> All right. Let's wrap this up. Look at this slide. Resistance.
that's opposition to blood flow, meaning it's like what's going to slow down the blood flow, slow down the pressure. There's three factors. Size of the lumen. Obviously, when you make the lumen smaller, meaning like, like the space of the blood vessel, when I make this thing smaller, the pressure goes up. And okay. I didn't put this thing as a rule. I'm giving you one. <laughs> what I'm saying is like, when you make the lumen half the diameter, it's not like it goes up twice. It goes up 16 times. It's there's like a, I don't know what you call it, but it's like an exponential relationship between the volume and the pressure. So as the volume goes lower, the pressure goes up, but it's not proportional. It's like exponential. I don't know if that makes sense, but the size of the lumen, right? And then how many blood vessels you have. So one pound of, I, I, it's what it is, is, one kilogram of fat has 400, 400 kilometers of capillaries. I tried to convert it. So like around a pound of fat has an extra 250 miles of capillaries. So that's, that's a lot. I mean, keep in mind the capillaries are really small, but you've got to feed all that now with blood. So that's going to make resistance go up. And then the thickness of the blood. That's what viscosity is. So somebody with more that's dehydrated, for example, they're going to have more viscous blood. And that's going to contribute to resistance. So size of lumen, length of vessels, blood viscosity. I don't need this slide. I don't know why I have it. Um, there are valves inside of your veins especially in your legs, I should say, in your legs, because that blood's going up your legs back to the heart. And remember how low the pressure is. So we've got a problem. How do we get that blood from your feet up to your heart? And the heart is the only thing generating that pressure. So your veins, your veins have valves in them. So if the blood goes above the valve and it tries to go back down with gravity, the valve will catch it and prevent it. <laughs> All right, so there's two mechanisms to help blood get up your body. One's called the skeletal muscle pump. And what it's saying here is that every time you step, every time you take a step, your calf muscles squeeze your vein and pushes the blood up. And then when you lift your foot up to take the next step, that valve will close. The blood can't flow back down again. So every time you're stepping, you're pushing blood a little further up your leg. So we call that a skeletal muscle pump. The other thing that helps is the respiratory pump. This is your diaphragm when it's relaxed. And this is your diaphragm when it's contracted. So when your diaphragm's contracted, it's pushing all your guts up against your inferior vena cava. And that's pushing blood up towards your heart. So that's the respiratory pump. I think this might be my last slide right here. Oh, wow, look at all this. What time is it? <laughs> I feel like I've lost you guys anyway. You want to finish this up on Wednesday? I know what you want, Hassan. Your answer is yes. I, I want to know. I understood everything you said already. I want to know, like, a gist of, like, because this is, this Wednesday we're taking the test, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. Let's so you want to, can we go over the test before we, like, end class? Yeah, let's go over that now. Let's solve this thing and go over the test now. Bet. Um You did great. I love today's lesson. I wrote it all down. I understood it. But I want to know what's on that test. You heard me. I need to get types of out. arteries. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on. I gotta get my little paper ready. All right. I test can put two. It back. All right. Types of arteries. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, factors influencing. 
factors influencing filtration and reabsorption. Explain them. Don't just put don't just put BHP. That doesn't mean anything to me. That's just letters. I understand. Let's go back to the heart. Wait, do I want you to know anything? Let's do else? um Yeah. Oh, um Oh, you go ahead. I'm sorry. No, let's do it. You were gonna add something and now you're like, oh, I don't wanna just tell him to put something on the test. Well, I don't it, if you're going to do something about the heart, do something that, like, I feel like that we are off from. Well, this is know. going to be the one that you're not going to want to see. Oh, sorry. Cardiac cycle? Yeah. What's wrong with that? That's easy. Well, that was the one that was, like, three slides. But if you're explaining it, then, yeah, it's easy. So the cardiac cycle, the... Cardiac conduction. That's what you did last week with the um with the square, and you did the aorta, the chambers, that shit. Oh, yeah. Excuse me. That stuff. Yeah. Okay, so I have that. All right. Yeah. Do you have a, you have a question, Lena? You might have to unmute yourself, or you could type it in the chat. Conduction system, that's the same thing as cardiac cycle, right? The conduction system was the one you just listed. It was the sinoatrial node, the AV node, bundle of his, or however you want to call it, bundle fibers. Okay, so we need both then. Or Kinji fibers. Um, I have a request. I know you made a slide already about this big old thing, but can you do like a... I know we did a we we kind of went a, not as in depth in the other um in the nodes and stuff. What's that? Can you like do a look? Never mind. Never mind. You're gonna post all the uh, modules that we need, right? I don't yeah. know. Someone was saying how the modules weren't working. No. So when you click on it, it's gonna lead you to the YouTube page that has all the videos. Like you'll see the YouTube page, and you'll see like four or five videos on the right that's so it like on youtube i put them i don't know what you call it but you you put them all into one category a playlist a playlist that that link puts you on the on the heart playlist so they're all short videos of that chapter that that's for the test that's what it's opening up to so it's not opening up to a particular video, but I want you to go to all of those four. I think there's four. And it's these. Like I've got one on the cardiac cycle. I've got a video on um, probably the EKG. And um, for like review questions, which kind of like, what are you leaning towards more? Like I'm giving you a test bank right here in the chat. How is an action potential guaranteed? Generated. Oh, generated. That's the part about the sodium, potassium, calcium, you know, like the... Um, what well, we went over Wednesday. Yeah, the, the, the plateau. Depo what causes like depolarization, plateau, repolarization? And wait, what kind of review questions are you going to bring up from like the last test or whatever, I guess? Oh, I mean, what kind of questions am I going to bring over from from quiz two? Yeah. That's a good question. Let me see how many questions I get with all of this stuff first, because if I hit, if I get enough for an exam, then I, then I won't do it. Like I won't. This looks like a lot of questions already. And what else did we talk about with the heart? We talked about. So right now we've got types of arteries. We got one, one, two, one, three, two, four, three. five, six, seven questions, basically. Right. I might make it just with this stuff. So 
let me just i might have enough just with the heart and the so factors affecting heart rate um like you're talking about like when you're dehydrated and your heart rate raises and your blood pressure goes down yeah like like for the so the, like that stuff like the here we talked about the factors affecting heart rate we talked about like the receptors um receptor wise like there are receptors so not like example wise like proprio receptors like hemo receptors yeah we'll put receptors i got a whole little video on that i think just on that i just wanted to make sure like that's what you wanted not, not like like factors affecting heart rate i would think about like the first thing that came up in my head was dehydration you know like the calming medicines and stuff like that Blood flow through the heart. You can start anywhere. People usually start at the right atrium. Like, where does the blood go after the right atrium? Like, what does it go through? It'll go through the. You should. It's a um, list. It's a you list. You should put the pregnant more. moms. Um, you should do the RH positive and negative thing on there, like as a bonus thing. You know, okay. so we can get a little extra points or whatever. That was an extra point because everybody got it right pretty much. Is there something I'm missing with the heart? I need to think about it. Oh, I know. Um, I might be done with this after this. Factors affecting stroke. Volume. You're doing. You're doing two different affecting. You put affecting with an A and affecting with an E. Which one is it? That is a good question. I think, I think it's with an E. Does anyone know? You know, I, I should know by this a. time. There's a difference between affect and effect, and I just I always forget what it is, and it's important not to put the wrong one. You're right, and I still put the wrong one all the time. But you know what? I'm not getting graded, so <laughs> it doesn't. No one cares at the end of the yeah, day. We'll see me. about that. Remember <laughs> the damn the damn survey that they forced down our throats to do? Yeah, you're like, he was a good teacher, but but fucking idiot with his A's and E's. Okay. Factors affecting stroke volume. What would be like what would what would you be looking for in that case? Preload. Contractility. Wait, hold on. Yeah. And wait, say it again. Preload. Contractility and after load. Four, five, six. After load? Seven, yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm going to put one so, more and we're done. Oh, that's a lot of new stuff on the test. Slow it down. What? Slow it down. You hurt my feelings. This is the last one. I think you have all the questions. What is being measured when a I mean, blood yeah. pressure is taken? Haha. Uh -huh. That one's easy. There we go. That's all 10 questions. I wonder if I can screenshot it and just put it as an announcement. Um. Yeah, I wrote it all down. Can you guys see all those? Um, can you guys see the chat and all of that? Well, I'm recording it too, so. We can yeah. see it in multiple screens. Honestly, I could see one, two, three, four, five, six, it's like eight times almost. Really? Wow. It's so like I've got 11, I've got 11 questions here all together. Y'all ready for this test, huh? Cause we about to get this shit rolling. Everybody better get an A now. You know what I'm asking? You know what I'm gonna ask? It's just, you gotta prepare oh. your stuff and you can't, don't half-ass your answers. Like, don't. I'm, like when I if I say if I say um, filtration and reabsorption, don't put BHP ICOP. You don't even know what that means. You're just writing letters. I, yeah, but you I want, want the to explanation what, it what we were is. going over earlier. If you don't remember interstitial fluid osmotic pressure, but you understand it in your head, and you're like, oh, well, the albumin's in the interstitial fluid, and it's kind of pulling. The, the fluid out of the capillary, I'm okay with you not knowing 
interstitial fluid osmotic pressure. I'm better with you explaining so, it. But you put ICOP and that's it. It's it's wrong. So um when FOP, I put explain, it means the, um, explain. Okay, hold on. BHP is just the blood pressure. Okay, FOP, interstitial yeah. fluid, osmotic pressure. That's more albumin in the interstitial fluid, right? Yeah. And the opposite of it is going to be BCOP, blood colloid, osmotic pressure, which means more albumin in blood vessels. Yeah. And it's the opposite, so filtration and then reabsorption. Yeah. So FOP pushes or pulls or does both? I kind of I was saying that myself. It's kind of like a puller. It kind of pulls the water out. Whereas blood pull. pressure, your blood hydrostatic pressure pushes the water out. And I'm using. And they both pull. Pressure. So one pulls out, and the other one pushes out. Yeah, I mean you don't have to get fixated on that part because that's just me saying that to help you understand it. You know, I like my little hacks where I make up random shit to help me memorize this shit. I want to explain it properly. I hacks need all my great. grades. You know. The hacks are great. All right. I'm ready for this test already. Well, no, what is on it is just are you going to prepare for it or not? And and I don't know, man. Every It seems like every test, some of you guys don't prepare. You wait till the last minute. It's, it's not going to happen. You can't do this. Wednesday morning or or you know two in the morning on on Wednesday it's it's, it's too I did late. it before I can do it again <laughs> it'd be a lot better Last if you worked on it a little bit today it. why do you think I'm here I know you guys will get it and that's it that's all we got today I mean it's already 10 40 so if someone wants to do my math homework I'll pay you I'll throw that out there. It would never be me unless it's addition. <laughs> Just throw it out there. So you guys got the qu anyone have any questions? I'm gonna stop presenting. All right, and I'm gonna stop recording. I will uh know. it takes a while for this thing to get uploaded and then I'll I'll, I'll put it on YouTube.